Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the ZK Hack Whiteboard Series. Um, I'm Brendan, I work at Polygon, and I'm here with Justin Drake. Uh, Justin is an Ethereum researcher. He is, I would say, a polymath uh, focused on crypto economic design, zero knowledge proofs, uh, hardware acceleration, VDFs, um, every, any, anything that touches the Ethereum L1. So welcome, Justin. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brendan. Um, and what are we going to talk about? So the topic for today is uh, Nova. What uh, is Nova? <laughs> good question. Um, so Nova is a fairly recent construction uh, that was published on ePrint in around March of last year. So it's just over a year old. Um, it was um, invented by Srinath Sethi. Um, and it's, I kind of think about it as a pre-processing step for snarks. So it's not a snark in and of itself, uh, but it's a very powerful technique that when used with a general purpose snark system can give us kind of the, the best of both worlds in, term of, in terms of very fast prover time and very, very fast and cheap verifier time. Cool. Sounds great. Um, all right. So what, uh, so, so it's a snark, um, and it's used for batching or recursion or so how does it work? Yeah. So, um, one way to think about it is as a generalization of BLS signatures. Um, so if you have, um, BLS signatures, you know, S1, uh, S2, all the way up to SN, the idea is that if these signatures are all signing over the same message, you can aggregate them and only have to verify the aggregate. Mm -hmm. um, and we use this actually on Ethereum today on the beacon chain, and this gives us roughly a 1000x improvement in verification time. Because instead of verifying n signatures, you essentially pay a cost to just verify many with sort of one operation. Exactly, right. And you can think of a signature as being a statement. The statement being, I know a private key that corresponds to this, uh, to this public key and I'm signing over this message. Um, and you can ask yourself, okay, can we generalize the statement to be any NP statement? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is exactly what Nova does. Um, so you have uh, S, so you have N statements. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to verify each of them individually, you fold them together. So the, the, the term that is used is a folding scheme you fold them all together, and then you, you only have to verify the last folded instance. Cool. So, so I, I guess for the non-complexity uh, theory uh, heads out there, the, the, it's, so, so I have these computations, and yeah. in, in normal sort of snark terms, I would have to generate a, a snark proving that each one is valid. And so instead, I don't uh, generate a snark. I just take the statements. I use Nova to fold them together, and then I can just verify the folded version. Yes, uh, cool. because snarks are very heavy machinery in the grand scheme of things. And here, basically, it's a way to feed less work to the snark prover and do more pre-processing work up front. Very cool. Yeah. And so one of the constraints here is that every statement has the same structure, mm -hmm. right? Just like BLS signatures, every signature is a signature. Um, the good news is that in the real world, we have structure everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, one example is VDFs, and we can talk about this, verifiable delay functions. Uh, but maybe a more general purpose example is a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. Think of the Ethereum virtual machine, or think of a RISC-V CPU, or a MIPS, um, um, where basically you have cycles that are repeating over and over again just like a real CPU, where the, the, the configuration of the transistors is fixed, that's the structure, and then what you feed into the transistors is what changes, that's, that's your witness. Okay, so, so I, I, it, it wouldn't work if I was doing um, maybe some elliptic curve group operations here and then hash functions here, but uh, in reality, like what, what, what we're often concerned with is um, like verifying the execution of some virtual machine that's doing the same thing at every step, and so we can exploit that repeated structure with Nova. Exactly. 
cool. Right. So in, in just the same way that um, the Ethereum virtual machine kind of gives you escape velocity for programming whatever you want on top of it, but the EVM itself is fully fixed and immutable and ossified and difficult to change. Here's the same thing. You can have a very fixed and ossified virtual machine that allows you to express whatever statements you want on top of it. Very cool. So what is, uh, what's sort of Nova being looked at uh, for today? Is, it, is the Ethereum Foundation uh, currently working on a project with Nova? Right. So we're um, working with 3 uh, on the VDF project. Um, so uh, VDF stands for Verifiable Delay Function. So we have these three letters and um, function is, just means that it takes an input and produces an output. Uh, this is not one of the most important letters. This is maybe the most important letter, which is the, the delay part. So computing the output of the function takes time. And the way that we mimic the notion of time with computation is using sequential computation that cannot be parallelized. So you have an input, you perform computation on it, which is sequential. That computation might take, let's say, one nanosecond. If you do a billion such steps, then you've simulated one second's worth of delay. And the verifiable aspect means that if you're a, a, a verifier, a weak verifier, for example, a blockchain, you want to be convinced of the correctness of the output without having to do all the heavy work of doing the, the sequential computation. You want to be able to immediately verify the output. So, so you could prove to me that, that something took you five minutes, um, but it would only take me a couple milliseconds to verify that proof. So, so if I'm like a validator on a blockchain, I don't have to do something for five minutes to ensure that you, know, you were bounded by some delay. Exactly. And the way that we use Nova for VDFs um, is by having a, a two-part construction of VDF. So we start with what we call a proto-VDF. And the idea of a proto-VDF is that you have computation, which is inherently sequential, where going in one direction is significantly harder than going in the other direction. Um, and the computation is reversible. And one way to do it, for example, is by taking roots in a finite field. So if you take, let's say, the fifth root, and you just do that again, take the fifth root, fifth root, fifth root. Taking fifth roots in a finite field takes, let's say, 100 operations. Yeah. But verifying a fifth root only takes a few operations because you only need to multiply a, a number with itself four, 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 four times. And so going in this direction is about 100 times slower than going in, in this direction. And what we do basically is that we, um, because we have this asymmetry, we, have, we stand a chance for a snark-like prover to actually prove the easy direction, which is equivalent to proving the, the hard direction. Um, and what we do is that we basically take batches of these fifth roots and we fold them together. And then at the end, we only have to check one, uh, one batch. Cool. So, so to generate the, uh, the function outside the circuit, it took you a long time. Yes. Um, but at the end, you're able to hand me a snark that I can verify very cheaply yes. that shows that, that the VDF was, has, or ver allows me to verify the VDF. Um, cool. So, yeah, I guess what, um, what other, like, where, where, where do you see Nova playing into the Ethereum ecosystem? Right. So... Um, one of the, the, the big themes nowadays, and it's, I guess, what you're working on as well uh, at Polygon, is ZK EVMs. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of what's, what's a ZK EVM? Good question. So it's basically the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, uh, which is snarkified. Um, so let me write down EVM. E -V Ethereum Virtual Machine. Right. So VM is a standard term, which means virtual machine. You're basically simulating something like a CPU. Mm -hmm. And E stands for Ethereum. It's basically the Ethereum variant of the, the VM. And it was designed to 
um, be useful in a, in, a, in a blockchain context. Um, and what we're trying to do basically is make the, the job of processing transactions or more specifically verifying the validity of um, state routes that progress with transactions. So you have batches of transactions that come in. These are called blocks. You feed them through the EVM and that progresses the state. And then you identify the state with a state route. Mm -hmm. And you want to prove the validity of these state routes. Um, and if we use a, a, a snark like proof system, uh, we get these very easy to verify proofs that might take a few milliseconds to verify. Um, and that bypasses all the work that you have to do to kind of naively re-execute all the transactions one by one. Cool. Cool. So, so replacing, so, so if I'm running my full node, I won't have to, uh, you know, execute every transaction in a block. Right. I'll just download a proof, download the updated state and, and check the proof. That sounds great. Exactly. Right. Um, and because the EVM is a, is a fixed VM, it has this structure. It has these cycles that repeat and repeat, and we can use this technique of folding. Um, and if you, if you zoom out, I, I kind of think of Nova as being a pre-processing gadget for Snarks. Mm -hmm. um, so Snarks is very heavy machinery, right? which you only want to use if you really, really need the benefits of Snarks. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can do basically is take this repeating computation, and then without having to deal with Snarks at all, start folding and pre-processing that. And then you have a much smaller statement that you feed into your, your snark uh, prover so that you get a tiny, tiny proof at the end. So, so, so that's really interesting. Maybe we could draw that out. Um, yeah. And so I think that's an important point. Because with snarks, we, we're paying for succinctness, right? Like we're paying to, to have small proofs. And so you're basically saying, uh, look, for Ethereum transactions in a block, we don't need to, to generate an individual snark for each one uh, and pay for, like, sort of pay the cost to, to shrink the verifier time. Instead, we can use folding, reduce the size of uh, the statement that we're trying to prove until it's more efficient. Um, to, to sort of snarkify it and make exactly. it exactly. Okay. So you have you have two um, kind of tools at, at your disposition. One of the tools is a snark, and that's extremely expensive relative to the other thing. Um, and basically, what it gives you is com compression. You can compress into something which is absolutely tiny to mm -hmm. to, to verify, but you want to feed as little work as possible to this compressor. And so it's, what, you, what you have is basically a, a hybrid system where you combine the compression with something else, which is the, the folding. And this folding stage kind of dramatically reduces the amount of work that you have to do in this compression stage. Um, and so really you get the best of both worlds. On the one hand, you get extremely fast proving, or should I say folding. Um, and on the other hand, the output of the compression is a very small and succinct proof. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is sort of our approach. Um, we, we use Fry instead of Nova, but at, at Polygon, we're, we're trying to exploit this trade-off in a very similar way where um, proving Ethereum transactions is the expensive part. Right. And so we don't want to compress and we want to use a configuration that allows us to maximize proving uh, time, uh, or I guess minimize proving time, um, and maximize efficiency. And then we can compress at the end when we like post to the blockchain and, and verification time starts to matter. Right. So I guess what you're saying is that we, let's use two snarks mm -hmm. for both steps. Mm -hmm. But these are snarks that are optimized for different things. Mm -hmm. This one's optimized for fast and cheap verification. This one for fast and cheap proving. Um, but I guess the, the realization of Nova is that you don't even need a snark. Yeah. This is overkill. Mm -hmm. You can achieve something, uh, you, you can get the power of snarks by just using folding. Very cool. All right, let's, uh, let's dig into Nova. Yeah, so I guess we can look at some of the nice properties that folding has. 
um, one, one of them is that there's only multi-exponentiations. There's no, no FFTs. So why is, this, why, why is it nice to avoid FFTs? Right, so one reason why it's nice to avoid FFTs is that you're doing one thing. You're just doing multi-exponentiations. And if you want to accelerate a SNARK, for example, in the extreme build a SNARK ASIC, you want your ASIC to be fairly simple. Um, so that's one, one, one advantage. Another advantage is that um, you don't need much memory. Like these FFTs can be memory hungry, but the multi-exponentiations, they're much more streamable, mm -hmm. um, which is also good for prover performance. Um, and I guess another advantage is that the steps that you're folding into each other can be very big if you need to. Um, and again, because you don't have this constraint on, on memory. And so if you take an approach where you, know, you have a, a, a very EVM equivalent circuit, that could be a humongous circuit, mm -hmm. um, each individual step, and you're not limited by the, the memory constraints of the NFT there, FFT cool. there. And we're, we're also not limited in our choices of elliptic curves, right? Because we don't need multiplicative subgroups for the FFTs. Exactly, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's a great point. And actually, the, the curves that we are working with also don't need to be pairing friendly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and so actually, it turns out that you can use um, SecP, which is the exact same curve that is used today for uh, Ethereum signatures and for Bitcoin signatures. Um, you don't have to, to invent exotic things. Um, one thing that you do need, however, is what's called a, a cycle of elliptic curves. Mm -hmm. um, and SecP has kind of this dual friend, which is called SecQ, mm -hmm. and these two combined uh, form a, uh, a, a curve. Okay, so so what's this? So how does this cycle work? Maybe, maybe we could diagram. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so a cycle elliptic. So the way that you define an elliptic curve is with basically what's called the the base field. So you have um, a field F, and then that allows you to define an elliptic curve, which then generates a scalar field. Mm -hmm. So um, you have another field here, F, FP. So this would be FQ, this would be FP. And it turns out that there's an impossibility result whereby the P and the Q have to be different. And so the question is, can you have two curves such that the relationship between the the base field and the scalar field is symmetric for the, for, the, for the two curves. So one curve has FP as the base field, the other one has FQ as the base field, and vice versa uh, for the scalar field. And this is useful because we are defining our constraints in the scalar field of, of the elliptic curve. So, so we're sort of programming in that field, yes. and we want that, but we're verifying our proofs in the base field. And so we, we want to be able to efficiently, we want those fields to match because, so we can efficiently verify base field operations in the scalar of one curve in the scalar field of another and vice versa. Exactly. So one of the things that I haven't touched on yet is folding, mm -hmm. sorry, is recursion in addition to the folding. So it, it turns out that when you, when you fold a statement into another, I lied a little bit when I said you only no, need to just, verify uh, the very last folded statement. Mm -hmm. You also need to verify that the folding was done properly. Okay. But the folding, checking that the folding was done properly is very, very cheap. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is you can actually do it as you go along in your circuit. Okay. So you have your initial computation, which is fairly large, and then you add just a little bit of overhead to perform the recursion. And as you said, in order to verify that the folding was done correctly, you're working in the base field because you're working with elliptic curve points, but uh, the constraint system is using the, 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 the scalar field. Mm -hmm. And so really what we're gonna have is we're gonna have this, this 
this back and forth between the two fields um, and get the efficiency on, on both sides. Cool. So, so when we're folding, maybe, maybe we could diagram that. We're, we're, not, we're not sort of compressing all at once. We're uh, like folding one into the other and, and we, we have this chain of... Yes. Okay. Okay, so let, let's, let, let, let's draw this. Yeah. So <clears throat> the idea of, uh, of Nova is that you're going to have what's called a running instance. So this is the, the, the instance in which you're going to fold the statements progressively. And it starts effectively empty, the, 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 the trivial uh, instance. And then in red is where I'm going to be doing the, the real work for some repeating function f. And then the next step is to fold the real work into the running instance to produce the next uh, iteration of the, the running instance. So basically we're folding these two into here and the node here is where the folding happened. And then we're going to do more folding of real work and, and the, the, the pattern repeats. So the red arrows are kind of the, that repeated computation that we sort of drew earlier. Um, and the black is, uh, I think it's sometimes called an accumulator in the literature, but basically tracks this, uh, like the progress of our folder. Right, you could call it an aggregator if you're using the terminology of Billis aggregate signatures, or you could call it an accumulator of sorts. Um, now, the, as we said, there is a cost to verifying the, that the, the folding happened properly. And so what we're going to do is this little trick where we're going to augment the function f to become a function f prime. So there's a, there's a prime here in green. And we're um, going to have f prime verify that the folding done here was, was done properly. Um, and so basically, the, each step that does real work is also checking that the folding was done properly for the previous step. Mm, okay. And then now my statement is true, my initial statement is true, which is if you f verify the very last folded instance, then you're kind of unraveling everything, checking not only the validity of every single iteration of f, but also that the folding was done properly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So what... Um what are some of the concrete uh, kind of performance characteristics of, of Nova? You said it's really fast. Right. So there's no FFTs. You're only doing multi-experimentations. And the question becomes, what is the constant? Mm -hmm. um, so if you have n constraints, for example, n R1CS constraints, you have to do um, basically two... Uh, you have to do two multi exponentiations of size n. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically the, the constant is two, which is at least a factor of two than the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And if you take a proof system like Planck, for example, or Graph 16, you, you, you'll be several times faster than them. And, and also, you don't have to do the FFTs. Mm -hmm. um, so you're winning. And also, because you don't have a pairing friendly um, curve, you have more performance. Mm -hmm. So you might have, let's say, 2x more performance here. Mm -hmm. You might have, let's say, I don't know, 4x more performance here. Here you have no FFTs, so that might give you like simplifications and a bit less, less, less work to do. And there's another benefit, which is that the so-called um, recursion overhead is very, very low. So this, the verifying that the folding is done properly is dominated by two scalar multiplications. Okay? And if you, if, if you were to write this as a circuit, which is what we are doing here with this function f prime, it's on the order of 20,000 gates. So it's a very small recursion overhead, which might give you, you know, a further boost here. So yeah. potentially you can have a proof system which is roughly 10x faster on the folding than if you were to use a snark naively. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Because we, we, we want to minimize both 
the cost, sort of the proving time for our statement, but also if we're doing recursion or aggregation, we need to uh, minimize the, the cost of actually performing the recursion. Yes, exactly. I mean, and zooming out, one of the, the trends in, in, in SNOCs is, is recursion. Mm -hmm. Recursion is extremely useful for many different things. It allows us, for example, to break down very large statements which are too big to true for our SNOC provers and break them down into small chunks. It allows us to have distributed proving where you give out work to different people or different um, you know, CPUs or different cores within a single CPU. Um, so you unlock parallelism and distribution, distributed proving. Um, and you also make it potentially easier to build hardware because you can, you can feed this, uh, these, these chunks. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Um, let's see, what are other advantages of, uh, of, of Nova? Um, I guess uh, one of them is that there's no trusted setup. Mm -hmm. So it's the transparent uh, proof system. And the general approach is also post-quantum upgradable, mm -hmm. meaning that um, if you want to use uh, lattices instead of Peterson commitments, um, then you get, you, get, you get the same construction, uh, but which is uh, instead of being based on the discrete log assumption, you might uh, base it on something like the LWE assumption. So it's a different assumption, um, the one which is uh, thought to be post-quantum secure. So for the, for the folding step, we just need some additive homomorphism or some structure, and, and we can get that with, with lattices. Exactly. The, the one constraint that we, that we need is a linearly homomorphic commitment, a vector commitment scheme, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, this, this, this technique of taking linear combinations, you know, is used you know, for example, with, with polynomial commitments. Um, but here, we don't, we're not even working with polynomial commitments. We're working with something which is less powerful, which is purely a vector commitment. Um, so that's kind of another advantage as well here. Cool. OK, so we've, we've gone through the high-level stuff. Let's start um, looking at some, some of the, 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 the details. Um, and I guess. What we can do before diving in too much into uh, the actual details, maybe we can start with a, a warm-up uh, example. Um, so let's let's start with very simple statements, uh, which you know don't give us all the expressivity of MP, but you know it will give us an idea of how things work. So remember how I said that every statement needs to have the same structure. So let's define the structure. Let's say that we have some matrix A. It could be any matrix. It could be one that's randomly generated, for example. And we have statements of the form A x i equals some vector. For example, the, the vector which is all, all ones, okay, which I'll, I'll write as boldface uh, one. Now, let's say that as a, a prover, I claim to have two such vectors which satisfy this. Um, and so I have x1 and I have uh, x2. Um, and I'm going to tell the, 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 the verifier what the commitments of these vectors are. So we have, the, when I have a, a line on the top, I mean the commitment of x1 and the commitment of x2. So the, the claim really is here that I know two vectors, x1 and x2, that corresponds to this commitment such that both x1 and x2 satisfy this. Mm -hmm. Now, the verifier is very lazy, right? He doesn't want to do much work. Um, and so kind of the, the naive approach would be for the prover to send over x1 the verifier to check that it matches the commitment. Same thing for x2. And on top of that, not only is there a lot of communication cost, but there's also computational cost because the verifier needs to do this, mat this matrix operation. So instead, what happens is that the verifier says, I'm going to give you a random number. 
Okay, and this is a classic cryptographic thing where we have an interactive game. So the prover sent these commitments. Um, so that's step one. The prover sends the commitments. The verifier, so the verifier is on, 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 on the right side, the prover is on the left side. The verifier just sends a random number, R. Um, and then the prover will, will basically take, both the prover and the verifier take a random linear combination of, of these vectors. So they take x1 plus r x2, and the commitment corresponding to this vector is going to be the same thing but with a hat. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be x1 plus r x2 committed, but because of the linear homomorphism of the commitment that we talked about earlier, this is actually equal to x1 plus r x2. And so this is something that the verifier can, can, can compute. And now the prover just needs to send one single vector, which is the opening of, of this thing here. The verifier checks the opening, and it can check this operation. So basically what we've done is that we've, we've halved the amount of work. And what is the, the cost? The cost is basically um, one scalar multiplication plus an addition, which is very, very cheap for the, for the, for the verifier. And this technique here, what we've done is that we've folded two instances, but we can fold a million, a billion instances and still end up with this very, very cheap thing at the end. And these, these commitments, we're just using the, the Peterson commitment to generate um, x1 and x2 hat. And then, uh, so, so instead of what, what, what we're doing is we're saving, um, the, the verifier just needs to check uh, a times this uh, term instead of checking a x1 hat and then a x2 hat. Yeah, so instead of having to ch check a x1 and a x2 individually, mm -hmm. which requires one kind of receiving x1 and x2, kind of downloading all this data, mm -hmm. and then two doing the computation, um, it, you only have to download the data once for this random linear combination and do the computation once. Um, right, okay. Um, so I guess the question is, how do we go from this toy example, mm -hmm. uh, which hopefully gives you the intuition, to something more expressive? So it, it turns out that um, like the, one of the standard ways to, to, to express an NP statement is with R, what's called R1CS. Mm -hmm. So R1CS, how does it work? You have three matrices. These are our square matrices, A, B, and C, and these are going to define the structure of your computation. And then the equation that you have is going to be A time, times a, a vector Z um, times B times the vector Z equals C times the vector Z. And so this, this um, Round circle here means that you're taking the element by element multiplication of, of, of vectors. So the, the dot product of the, because vector, vector, dot product, yeah. Exactly, yes. Or, or sorry, no, well, not the dot product. It's the dot product before the sum. Uh, product, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's element wise multiplication. <laughs> so um, the A, B, and C are matrices. A times Z, B times Z, C times Z are vectors, mm -hmm. and this vector times a vector is, is a vector. Okay. Now, it, it turns out that um, this trick of taking a linear combination, let's imagine that Z is going to be a random linear combination of a Z1 plus a Z2 with a, with a random coefficient. It turns out that if you, if you plug in a Z like this and you expand it out, you, you get cross terms. And by cross terms, um, we mean kind of 
when you have both indices one and two that are involved. And so what we want to do is actually generalize this R1CS to something that Srinath has called relaxed R1CS. And it's relaxed because you allow two things. One is that you have an extra vector E, which um, we call the slack vector. And then we have an extra coefficient here, U, which is a, a, a scalar. Yes. And so now your, your, your witness for the statement is Z, U, and E, and the structure is still A, B, and C. And so these uh, terms just let us uh, cancel out the cross terms that might come up um, when we uh, are taking the Hadamard product of this, or the, yeah, of this. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, um, the, the term E here will, absorbs, will absorb the, uh, the, the cross products. Uh, so it's kind of a, a more flexible R1CS that, um, and this, this flexibility allows it to, um, to take the shape of what we want. So basically what we want, we want to be in a position whereby proving two statements of this form, so basically where we have a z1 times b z1 u1 z1 e1 and proving the same thing but with a 2 a z2 b z2 equals u2 c z2 plus e2 proving these two things is equivalent to to proving a statement of the form a z b z equals u c z plus e where z is this random linear combination cool um yeah, it, it feels weird to be going back to R1CS after so many years in, uh, in Planck uh, constraints. This is interesting. Right. So this, this we started with R1CS, but we t it, it turns out it's not flexible enough mm -hmm. to do the, the, folding. the, the folding. But it, it, it turns out that um, you, you can have much of the expressivity of other things like, like the Planckish arithmetization or things like Plookup using relaxed R1CS. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so, so how, do we, how do we adapt uh, this technique? Um, I guess it's straightforward, uh, adapting it to this R, uh, relaxed R1CS. Yes, it's, it's straightforward, but really what I have to, to, to do is kind of tell you what you and E must, must be in order for this equivalence to be the same. Okay. And you can just write it down and do the arithmetic, but um, I guess I can just you know, tell, you, tell you what it is. Like U is going to end up being um, U1 plus RU2. So very similar looking to, to, to this guy. Mm -hmm. And then E, is going to end up um, being something like E1 plus R squared E2 plus the cross terms. Mm -hmm. And the cross terms um, are going to look like A Z1 times B Z2 plus A z2 b z1 minus u c u1 c z2 minus u2 c z1 and every single cross term are basically crossing the ones and the twos mm -hmm. and everything cancels out and everything works out nicely uh, when, when 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 you plug it in cool so, so when we, we actually write uh, constraints for this uh, form, we're defining, like our sort of program is, is, is it A, B, 
C and E, or is E uh, part of our witness? How, do, how does that? So work? E is E is part of the witness. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess one one important question here to to ask ourselves is um, what is going to be the 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 cost for the for the for the verifier to to keep an updated version of E, U, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it, for Z and E is going to be commitments of these things. Mm -hmm. The verifier is just like, just like here, basically the, the verifier is only working with commitments. These commitments are very succinct, and so they're very easy to, to, to work with. But, but as long as we have our linear homomorphism, we're, we're sort of set and we don't have to keep... Exactly. Okay. And so we can have a look, how many scalar multiplications are there? Because that's going to be the dominating thing. So there's going to be one, one here, where you're multiplying by R in order to update Z. The addition is very cheap. Mm -hmm. You're going to have one here to uh, multiply by R squared. Mm -hmm. And in addition, what the prover does is that it's going to send a a commitment to this, these cross products. So we're going to define T, which is all, all these cross products, and the prover is going to send, um, send the commitment to T. And so really what the verifier has to do is compute, um, sorry, there's, there's an R missing here. Is going, is going to have to compute R times 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 the commitment of T. So we end up having three um, scalar multiplications in the recursive verifier circuit. And um, this is something that I'll, I'll draw uh, very very soon. When when you're folding um, in an R1CS, something which is not yes. relaxed, but really the, the standard R1CS, you, you end up in a position where e, e is zero, right? Because that's, that's the standard uh, R1CS, where E is zero and U is, is one. And so you, you end up not having to do this. This goes away in, in practice. Um, and this costs about 10,000 gates constraints. Mm -hmm. This is about 10,000 constraints. And so together, the whole verifi verification circuit is about 20,000 constraints. Cool. And we, we, we can sort of see why we need that repeated structure, because this uh, only works if, uh, we, we, if, if A, B, and C are sort of different for each statement, then, uh, then the that doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That identity doesn't hold. Cool. OK, so let me try and provide some intuition here, because we have lots of symbols. Um, <laughs> And, and let, let's go back to the um, to, to to this diagram. So we have a running instance which gets updated with um, the instances where you do the, the the real work. They get folded in. And where does the verifier circuit come in? Basically, we want to check that the work of doing the verification here is correct. And so the function here does, does verification. But one thing that I, that I haven't shown yet is how do we work with the cycles of elliptic curves? Mm -hmm. right. And so here, really, we're not going to have one running instance. We're going to have two running instances. Um, and the way that I, that I think about it is with a, um, a slightly staggered running instance. So doing this, this arrow, this green arrow, is inefficient mm -hmm. because you have a, a mismatch in the fields, the, the base field and the scalar field. And so instead, we want to be working mod P here, 
Here we're working with the prime P, here we're working with the prime Q, and what is efficient is to be, to be, so here are, 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 because the only thing that you're verifying here is just the folding, I'm gonna have a, a, small, a small arrow, because there's very little work to do relative to these red arrows where a lot of the work happens. Mm -hmm. And so this small arrow is gonna prove the validity of this guy. And then this guy here is gonna prove the validity of the folding here. And then same thing happens again. These prove the validity like this, and these guys provide the, the validity like this. Cool. Great. Um, so I guess one thing that we've achieved here, like the, 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 the term that we have here is what's called incrementally verifiable computation, mm -hmm. I, IVC. And one of the downsides here is that you have this extremely sequential thing going on. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is not great if you wanna have lots of parallelism or even better, lots of distributed provers that all collaborate uh, on, on one task. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there is a, a generalization of this diagram which um, gives us PCD, proof carrying data, where you can have multiple provers and kind of jointly collaborate and you can unlock parallelism. Uh, do you want to see kind of the, the, yeah, the diagrams? <laughs> Okay, um, so here I guess the, 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 the basic building block is, is this, this, this triangle here, right? Where the, where the, where the folding happens. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what basically defines the, ver the verifier circuit that, that, that powers the, the recursion. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can we have a more generalized triangle mm -hmm. that unlocks recursion? And the answer is yes. So, so the, sort of the basic building block that we use for recursion, whether we can have yes. it have two arrows uh, instead, or sort of more than two. Arrows. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So let's, so here we have two input arrows. Why don't we try four input arrows? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's see. We're gonna have two running instances in black, and we're going to have two instances where real work happens. We're going to fold these into their own. So this is an instance folded of these. This is the folded instance of this and this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to fold these two into yet another folded instance. And this is going to define our basic green triangle. And now basically we want to have a pattern where we can recursively fit in this triangle so that all the inputs and outputs uh, match. And one way to do it is by basically having another triangle that come right next to it. Um, where, okay, I'm gonna have to erase, erase this guy. So we have two triangles. Each triangle produces a, a, a running instance. So this produces a running instance, this produces a running instance. And now, in order to fit the pattern, we need to have two instances that do work. Mm -hmm. Two red instances like this. And now we can complete the pattern like this. And as you can see, we have a new triangle here. Perfect. Like, like this. But, and um, so in, in reality, I, I think we would have like another 
like parallel running instance because we need to uh, have our cycle uh, uh, verifying this efficiently, but yes, yeah, the, yes, yes. not not to overcomplicate. Yes, yes, yes. But okay, then, so so this makes a lot of sense. That's very cool. Um, and so basically, um, just to, to to give a little bit more explanation of, of of what's going on here is that we have these these instances that do the real work. We're folding them, but we also want to prove the validity of these these green triangles. Mm -hmm. And this is done in the same way with um, basically instances that sit outside the triangle. Mm -hmm. And this is what allows us to do the recursion. Is like so this red line is going to prove the validity of this triangle, the folding of this triangle, and this red line is going to prove the validity of this triangle here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what we've done basically is um, we've, we've unlocked this very fast pre-processing stage, which is parallelism friendly and, distribute, and friendly to distributed uh, provers. Yeah, because we, I mean, if we're doing, um, if we're trying to process transactions in a block, we, we can divide the transactions in the block across many nodes exactly. that can all prove in parallel. And then we can uh, use the folding scheme to end up with our desired single statement that we can right. then wrap and it, we, we, we can activate the compressor. And, exactly. Uh, use yes. the snark. And I guess one question we can ask ourselves is, what kind of compressor do we want at the very end? So we're working with Peterson commitments. Mm -hmm. So a very natural thing that we can use is bulletproofs. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do a little bit of work, basically change the bulletproof scheme a little bit to work with this extra slack vector. Mm -hmm. um, Srinath himself um, has also a variant of, of Spartan, which um, kind of works well as this final wrapper. And there's another project that the Ethereum Foundation is uh, working on, which is to have the final wrapper um, be basically a stock oh, and, and cool. use Fry. Cool. Um, what's the uh, what's sort of the motivation there? Because we're we're, we're kind of sacrificing succinctness a little bit um, with Fry. Right. So the the just the reasoning here is that uh, we want the final proof to be friendly to the EVM. Mm -hmm. And here we're using curves that are not EVM friendly. So we're using, for example, the pasta curves. That's yeah. what actually is being used in, in, in production, the, pa the cycles oh, okay, of pasta okay. curves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, but, but we could, um, I mean, we, we, we could use sec P and sec Q, um, but then we can't really use bulletproofs uh, with those, and so okay. okay. So the 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 problem with I guess sec p and sec q is that even though the signature scheme it uses these curves, I don't think there are opcodes. Yeah, yeah. So there's the yeah. EC recover opcode, yeah. but I'm not sure there's all the other opcodes that you need. Yeah, that are exposed as yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So so just being able to do uh, like doubling and addition, we we, we can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, wow. So we've uh, we've gone through Nova. We've learned about folding, recursion. We've moved from IVC to PCD. Um, so where can people go to find more? Right. So um, as I mentioned, like the the scheme is fairly recent. It's from um, March twenty twenty one, and there isn't that much educational material. There's the paper on ePrint. There's one 20-minute presentation by Srinath on YouTube, and there's also um, about 10 pages uh, in uh, the Justin uh, Fowler's book. Uh, and I actually uh, just learned that there is a Justin Fowler kind of study club as part of ZK Hack, uh, where a group of people, including Justin himself, are running through the whole book. So if that's of interest to you, um, do join that discussion. Um, so yeah, that's in terms of the educational material. And I, I feel like one reason I was excited to talk about Nova is because not many people know about it. And I think there's a lot of potential there to, uh, to help with, uh, with ZKVMs, uh, potentially. And 
one of the exciting things is that not only has Srinath written an academic paper, he's also written in Rust very high quality code, um, an open source implementation, which you can find on GitHub. Um, GitHub.com slash Microsoft slash Nova. Yeah. M MIT licensed. Um, yeah, so Srinath is one of the best, I think, academic uh, sort of cryptography engineers. His implementations are always super, super fast. Right. Um, and not only is it fast to start with, but we've also been collaborating with Supranational that has made it even faster, <laughs> both in terms of having a super optimized CPU implementations of the, the, the pasta operation, pasta operations, but also a GPU implementation acceleration for the, the most consuming operations, which is the multi-experienciations. So you can take something which is off the shelf and extremely fast pre-processing for your ZK EVM. Very cool. So, so we, we can see Nova in hopefully VDFs in uh, the Ethereum base chain, potentially a future ZK EVM, um, and yeah, wh wh whatever future work sort of comes from that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some um, questions, I guess, for implementers. Um, one question might be, you know, what is the, the best final proof to use? Like one of the downsides of bulletproofs, for example, is you get succinctness of the proof, but you don't get succinctness of the verification time. The verification time is still linear in your step size. And so um, I think the work that we're doing with the MENA Foundation and the NIL Foundation to use basically FRI as the final uh, step uh, is going to be uh, a useful primitive for the whole space. Um, this project is, you know, relatively uh, um, ambitious and it's still in, in, in the work, and it might take a few more months uh, to 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 really be be polished. But um, actually, the the reason why we're we're working on frying, I guess, um, a mult, um, Pasta multi exponentiations is because the, the MENA blockchain, its proofs uses the Pasta curves. And we want to build a, a bridge between the MENA blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain. So we kind of allow us to have code reuse uh, with, the, with, with the Nova project there. Um, and I guess another question is around having to use R1CS, right, as we, as we talked about. Um, and you know, people have been used to custom gates that are very, you know, ex expressive, and people have been used to things like like plookup, um, and you know, for example, for custom gates, one of the things you can do if you have degree more than two gates, you can reduce them down to degree two gates, which you can do with R and CS, um, and um, Srinath also believes that there's a uh, he's been talking to a, a PhD student. Um, quite a long time ago, where basically uh, the claim was that you can do uh, plookup queries fairly cheaply, even with R1CS, you know, something like five constraints for one uh, plookup query. I need to look into the details here, and it's possible there's other teams also doing kind of independent work uh, to kind of make these techniques be friendly to more arithmetizations than just R1CS. Cool, cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I really was surprised by how, how simple and sort of easy to understand the scheme is. And so I, right. I think that's, that's a cool feature. Um, well, great. Thank you so much, Justin, um, for, for joining me. Um, thanks to Anna and Tanya from the ZK Hack team. And uh, yeah, we'll stay tuned for more on Nova. Yeah.